Um, I first want to just point out and remind you there was a typo on which page to submit for homework number eight. Um, it's supposed to be page 54. It said 51, and that's not right. Um, so some people did submit in a page 51 to me, and that's part of your notes. That wasn't the homework. So sorry about that typo. I had it right at the top, but I didn't have it right at the bottom. So this is your homework from Friday. And um, if you haven't done it yet, please, it's just one page, get it done, turn it in um, so that we can give you some feedback on that. All right, here we are at day nine. And of course we have a date typo. It is Tuesday, uh, the 19th, is today the 19th? Oh, today is the 20th. So today is 420. All right, so we have a pedigree here. And on Friday, um, we went over how to label the people in a pedigree. So just as a reminder, and I'd like you to do this to your own pedigree here, let's label these generations. So we do that with Roman numerals. So we have our first generation, then we have our second generation, and we have a third generation. And then Christy down here is our fourth generation. So anytime there's a descent line, so remember we talked about the line that goes down, that's a descent line, that makes a new generation. So a generation means the next set of family members, right? So then within a generation, we can number the, we number the individuals with Arabic numbers. So regular numbers, the numbers you use in math. So William would be number one, Evelyn is two, Charlie is three, Gloria is four. And then we start over again with the second generation. So we, we label everyone in one generation with Arabic numbers starting at one, and then we start over with the next generation. So label your people so that you know how to identify them when you're being asked questions about them. Christy is number one. Um, another thing that we uh, learned about on Friday is um, about the age of individuals on a pedigree. So we list people oldest to youngest going from left to right. Okay, and this is mostly um, when, you're, when you're putting siblings on um, a pedigree, when there's marriages and things get a little bit more tricky. But if you're, late, if you're listing the siblings of a couple, like in this case, William and Evelyn's kids, Eric, Ellen, Dorothy, and Mary, Eric is older than Mary. So especially with, with siblings, we label them oldest to youngest. Um, it's possible, you know, that Peter is older than one of these people, but because he's from a different family, we don't have to worry about that. And then Peter is older than Larry. Larry's the youngest in this family. Okay, so oldest to youngest from left to right. All right, so we can answer some questions about their relationships to each other because of the connections that we can see. Um, we can answer questions about who's older than who. So the first question is who is the oldest, Ellen or Mary? So here's, here's Ellen, two, two. Here's Mary, two, four. So who's older? Ellen. Ellen is to the left of Mary, so she is older. All right. Um, in your homework, you had a couple of relationship questions. So the first one is who is Evelyn to Cheryl? So we're wondering who is Evelyn? So Evelyn's up here in two, I'm sorry, one, two, that's Evelyn. And who is she? to Cheryl, who's down here, three, two. 
Yeah, so um, someone in my class is saying grandma. That's correct. Cheryl's mother has a mother named Evelyn. So grandma, mom, Cheryl. So we got grandma here. All right, who is Charlie to David? So Charlie's up here in the first generation. David is here on the third generation. So who is Charlie to David? Yeah, grandpa. Yep. Um, some people were making the mistake in the homework and saying like, grandma instead of grandpa and like that just you weren't looking at the circle or the square so you might have gotten things wrong you got to pay attention i know the name charlie for most of you you're like well that's a male but oftentimes a gene or, or a pedigree like this doesn't have their names on it so you just have to recognize that a square is a male and a circle is a female all right who is eric to cheryl yeah so somebody in my class is saying uncle. So here's Eric and here's Cheryl. So Cheryl's mom and Eric are siblings. So that means Eric is Cheryl's uncle. Yep. All right, how many kids did Charlie and Gloria have? What do you guys think? Yeah, so here are Charlie and Gloria. They have one, two, three, four, five kids coming off their sibling line. Mary's not their child. She just married their son, Peter. All right, and the last question is, are Mary and Peter related to each other? Besides being married and their husband and wife, but are they related in any other way? They are not. Um, so not that we can see in this pedigree because there's no connection anywhere up here of their parents being related, right? So Mary's parents are over here on the maternal side and Peter's parents are over here on the paternal side, which means father's side. And um, there's no connection up here that would indicate that these two are related in any way. All right, somebody asked me about adopted kids and how they're added. And I just wanna point out that from our notes the other day, I gave you this little chart here that gives you some extra symbols to use when you're filling in the pedigree. So adopted, you would just put brackets around the square or the circle to indicate that they weren't the biological um, children of that couple, but you could still connect them. Um, you would just put brackets around their um, their circle or square, like I like I did here. Oops. So brackets around the circle or square um, represents an adoption, but you would still you could still connect them to the sibling line. You just have to indicate that they um, aren't biologically connected they're just they're adopted all right any other questions on how to tell um who's who on a pedigree so this is going to come back today because we're going to start tracking genetic disorders through families pedigrees and so you do need to understand um, connections to each other in order to figure out the risk of passing on a genetic disorder or um, what type of disorder we're looking at. Okay, so today's topic, um, we're actually not gonna be doing anything with X-linked today. We already spent um, a day talking about X-linked. So we'll, we'll come back to what that looks like on a pedigree tomorrow. Today, we're really focusing on the difference between autosomal dominant and autosomal recessive traits. So 
Before we go any further, we need to understand what the heck is an autosome. So if we, it's a car place. Yes, get in the zone, autosome. Um, no, it's not, not in this case. So there's two different types of chromosomes in, a, in the human body, okay? We have 22 pairs of what we call autosomes. So that's pair number one through 22. The, the word autosome, auto means self, and some means body. So these chromosomes are the ones that code for a lot, most all of the traits of your body. It's pair number 23 that's special. Okay, because that, that is your sex chromosomes that determine your sex. So um, all of these other chromosomes, pairs number one through 22, can have traits on them. And when they do, we call that trait autosomal. Okay, so one pair one through 22 are your autosomes. And pair number 23 is your sex chromosomes. Um, and again, what we're looking at here is a picture of somebody's chromosomes. And when we have a trait that's autosomal, it means that that trait lies on one of these chromosomes and pair number one through 22. So for instance, we could say um, a trait lies on chromosome number 11. And that's where um, we find the DNA that codes for that trait. Or maybe we say a trait lay, lies on chromosome number 13. That's an autosomal trait, okay? So a lot of the traits that make up our bodies are, they lie on these trait, um, on these pairs one through 22. By the way, what is the sex of this person whose picture of their chromosomes we're looking at? This is a male. Oh, you guys can't see my, why did you tell me it's not up there? Sorry, I'm just on talking without my, I, um, <sighs> it's a good day. All right, so this is a male because there's an X and a Y chromosome, right? Um, and remember how I told you that X linked traits are on the X because the Y is just shorter. And so these traits don't actually lie on the Y chromosome. Um, so, something like um, color blindness or hemophilia is something that lies on the X chromosome and the Y chromosome being smaller doesn't have that DNA on it. So when we talk about X-linked traits, um, that's why. All right, so let me, I gotta um, do something real quick here for my students in my class. When we got booted, I stopped projecting onto my TV. Here we go. Awesome. Okay. Okay, so when there's a genetic trait or a disorder on one of the autosomes, so one of your chromosomes pairs number one through 22, we call that trait autosomal, okay? So the, that term autosomal just means it's on one of those 22 pairs of chromosomes. When there's a genetic trait found on your sex chromosomes, so pair number 23, then we call it sex linked or X linked. And um, just like I said, most X-linked traits are on the X chromosome. So for this class, we're only looking at recessive X-linked traits. So we're, there are some that are X-linked dominant and there is um, there are some traits that are found on the Y, but we're not gonna go, we're not gonna go there in this class. Okay, so we're always just gonna be looking at X-linked recessive traits like um, hemophilia and color blindness. Um, from last week. So just as a reminder, um, males have um, XY and females have the sex chromosomes XX. 
And again, we'll be looking at um, X-linked pedigrees tomorrow. So today we're not gonna really talk any more about X-linked till tomorrow. Okay, so we're gonna start off by looking at an autosomal recessive trait um, called albinism or being an albino. So in order to have an autosomal recessive trait, the person needs to have two recessive alleles. So for albinism, we're gonna use the letter A. So in order to show up as albinism, a person needs to have two recessive alleles. Okay, so you have to be homozygous recessive in order to show an autosomal recessive trait. Okay, I'm gonna repeat that one more time. A person needs to be homozygous recessive in order to show an autosomal recessive trait. So that means both pairs of those chromosomes that I just showed pictures of, they need to both have the recessive trait, the recessive allele. And that means that the person who is albino got one recessive from their mom and one from their dad. You need two, okay? With autosomal recessive, you need two recessive alleles. So both of your parents had to give you one in order to have it. So an example of an autosomal recessive trait is albinism um, being albino. And this um, disorder is um, characteristic of lacking pigment in the hair, eyes, and skin. And so um, we have a picture here of a young boy who has albinism. So he has no pigment in his hair, skin. And then um, a true albino, their eyes actually appear red. And the reason their eyes are red is because there's no pigment in their iris. And so you see the blood vessels behind their iris. So you're basically looking straight through their eyeball into where their blood vessels are. Um, so there are different um, uh, variations of being albino. So it's not every single person has absolutely no pigment in anything. There's different um, levels of it. We also see albinism in the animal kingdom. So we have an albino squirrel here. We have an albino alligator and an albino giraffe. Um, so this also occurs in um, other animals besides humans. So let's take a look at the different genotypes that you can have for albinism. So a person can have two dominant alleles and their normal pigment, meaning they have pigment in their skin, hair, and eyes. And we call them, um, we, we say that they're not carrying the disorder, okay? I mentioned carriers last week when we looked at X-linked traits. So somebody who's heterozygous for albinism, um, we call them a carrier because they're carrying the allele that causes it but they are normal pigment. So they wouldn't even know that they're carrying the albino allele until they have an albino child, perhaps. Unless somebody in their family had albinism, like maybe a dad had it and he passed on that recessive allele, then you would know that you were heterozygous for albinism. And then again, in order to have the disorder of albinism, you need to have two recessive alleles. Okay, so I'm just gonna remind you again, for an autosomal recessive trait, a person needs both copies of the recessive gene to have an autosomal recessive disorder because the dominant one covers it up just like it did before. So the only way to have an autosomal recessive disorder is to have both recessive alleles. Um, and just a little bit more about albinism. So um, albinos have normal brain functioning. Um, their biggest concern is sunlight. 
because they because they lack melanin in their skin, they can get sunburned very easily. Um, also, their eyes can be really sensitive to the sun. So um, oftentimes, the biggest thing is keeping out of the sun or keeping skin not exposed to the sun, um, which gets a little harder when you live in a place that's sunny all the time, like near the equator. So um, there are actually villages where children with um, albinism have to, they, they stay indoors most of the time um, because going outside is, is dangerous for them. So um, while it doesn't affect brain functioning, it could, it could um, affect your normal lifestyle of being able to go outside. All right, if a baby is born with albinism, who did they get their disorder from? Both parents, right? So mom, they have, if, in order to have it, you're uh, um, homozygous recessive. So you got one of them from your mom and one of them from your dad. Now this doesn't mean mom and dad are albino. Mom and dad can be normal pigment and be heterozygous, right? So this is gonna come in to play when we start looking at um, pedigrees of autosomal recessive disorders. Okay, so um, just one more little recap here. For, a, for an autosomal recessive disorder, you need to have two recessive alleles. And so um, homozygous dominant is normal. Heterozygous is also normal, but they are what we call a carrier. And to be albino, you have to be little a, little a. All right, moving on to the other type, autosomal dominant. This is different, okay? These are still traits that lie on an autosome. So on chromosomes number one through 22, but now the person only needs one dominant allele to show the trait because it's autosomal dominant, okay? So somebody who is big A, little a is going to have an autosomal dominant trait. You only need one dominant allele and you show the trait, okay? You can also have two dominants, but these alleles aren't common. So, but the fact that you only need one makes it more common in a family. So we'll talk about that in just a little bit. So this means that only one of a person's pairs need to have the dominant allele. So you got it, you get it from either your mom or your dad. Um, and again, it could be both that you could be homozygous dominant, but having just one dominant allele gives you the trait. All right, so an example we have of autosomal dominant is dwarfism. Um, so this is a condition of being extremely short. Um, if you look it up, it says less than four foot 10 as an adult. Um, so, In order then to have dwarfism, um, you only need one dominant allele. So there are no carriers. You either have the disorder or you don't have it, you're normal, okay? So um, being homozy homozygous dominant means you have dwarfism. Being heterozygous means you have dwarfism. And anyone who is not a, um, doesn't have dwarfism is little a, little a, homozygous recessive. Um, so you get this disorder from a dominant parent. So a parent has to have it in order for a child to get it. They have to be showing the trait in order for the child to get it, just um, in the case of dwarfism. Um, another name for dwarfism is here, achondroplasia. I think that's how you, or plasia. I maybe say plasia, achon, achondroplasia is another word for dwarfism. All right, so we're gonna use Ds to represent dwarfism. Um, so again, uh, 
homozygous dominant genotype means that you're a dwarf. That's your phenotype, right? And then heterozygous would be dwarf and then um, homozygous recessive is normal height. All right, so let's do a Punnett square to determine um, the possibility of passing dwarfism on to your children. So um, we have two parents here. Here's mom, I know that because these are eggs and here's dad, I know that because these are sperm. And um, all you're gonna do is fill in this Punnett square just like we've been doing since day three. Okay, so just fill in the Punnett square, just like you have. The only difference here is now we're talking about a genetic disorder versus like hair color or the ability to roll your tongue. All right, so what are the chances that this couple are gonna have a child who's a dwarf? And we're not worrying about males or females here. We're just saying, what are the chances that these two people are gonna have a child who's a dwarf? 50%. So these two offspring, so two out of four are gonna be dwarfs. So they have a 50% chance since dad was a dwarf, they have a 50% chance of passing it on to their offspring because you only need one dominant allele and you have the disorder. All right, what about, what are the genotypes of the parents? If you guys are like, I don't remember what a genotype is, that means you need to study from, from day one or day two when we talked about what a genotype is. What are the genotypes of these two parents? Yep, so we have a heterozygous parent, that would be dad. And we have a homozygous recessive mom. All right, what are the phenotypes of the parents? So what is dad? Dad would be a dwarf. And mom? She would be normal height. All right. This is a throwback to the third day of this unit. What is the genotype ratio of this cross? If you're starting with two, you are wrong. You need to include how many of the children are gonna be big D, big D. That's your first number. So we have to start with zero. Just because there's no kids that have the genotype of big D, big D does not mean you omit it from your, from your ratio. You must include it. So we have zero big D, big D to two heterozygous to two homozygous recessive. So it's a zero to two to two. How about phenotype ratio? So we're counting up how many have the dominant trait. So how many are gonna be dwarfs to how many are gonna be normal? So what is the ratio? Two to two, right? You have two kids that are gonna be dwarfs and you have two chances of them being normal. Okay, you got a 50-50 chance that you're gonna have a child who's a dwarf or a child who's normal heighted. All right. 
Now let's do an example of Punnett square where we're looking at autosomal recessive. So we're going to use albinism again. And there's a there's a blurb here if you want to read more about albinism, if you're um, interested in albinism. Um, the big thing I want you to pay attention to in this is that it's located on chromosome number 11. Okay, so that's just, we know exactly what chromosome albinism's DNA lies on, and we just know that it happens in chromosome number 11. All right, so let's look at how this disorder is passed on. The parents are both heterozygous. So let's fill in a Punnett square using the letter A with both parents being heterozygous. So I want you all right now, you all should be able to set up this Punnett square and fill it in. We have done nothing new as far as setting it up and filling it in. So two parents that are both heterozygous means mom is big A, little a, and so is dad. Both heterozygous. So dad can give a big A or a little a, and so can mom. All right, now, the only thing that's changed here is what these genotypes mean for the children, okay? Because now we're talking about genetic disorders, but otherwise nothing has changed in how we do these and how we answer questions about them. Um, so what are the chances that these parents are gonna have a child who's an albino? 25%, 25% right here. They have a, a one in four chances of having a child who is albino. By the way, were mom and dad albino? No, they were carriers. So they were both normal. So it is possible for two normal parents to have a child who's albino and then go, whoa, we carry the gene for albino. Um, and, and may not even know it. So that's, that's how autosomal recessive traits can skip a generation. So we'll talk about that tomorrow um, a little more, but uh, what are the chances that these parents are gonna have a child who is a carrier? So a carrier means heterozygous, right? So that's 50%, oops, meant to do that here. 50%. All right, what would the genetic, I'm sorry, the genotypic ratio be of this cross? One to two to one. Absolutely. So we have one big A, big A, we have two heterozygous and we have one little a, little a. One to two to one is always the ratio when you cross two heterozygous parents. It'll always be one to two to one. How about phenotype ratio? So we're counting up how many are normal who have the dominant trait to how many are albino. This would be three to one. Again, none of that has changed since the third day that we talked about genotype and phenotype ratio. You're still counting up the number that are showing the dominant trait, where in this case, dominant means normal to how many are showing the recessive trait. All right, what are the genotypes of the parents here?
Both of them are heterozygous. Right, here's mom, here's dad. They're both heterozygous. And then what are their, what's their phenotype? Are they albino or are they normal? They are both normal. Again, this is how autosomal recessive traits get passed on. Two normal parents can have a child that has the disorder because of the heterozygous um, individual hiding it. They're carrying it, but they're not showing it. All right, and the last question is just asking about what chromosome it's on, and I had pointed that out. It's on chromosome number 11. All right, I would like to right now um, show you an example of an autosomal dominant trait on a pedigree um, because I um, have been recently creating a pedigree of my own family um, to share with my family how it's been passed on in, in, um, within generations. So I'm gonna share that with you. I think I showed this to you last week um, so I want to, I'll start with showing you that, um, the mutation that I have is a mutation in a gene called BRCA2, and it's a gene that's located on chromosome number 13, and we all have BRCA2 genes. You, everybody, every human has two copies of the BRCA2 gene. And it's a gene that normally when it's functioning correctly, it's, it, it repairs damaged DNA. So if you go out in the sun and you get a sunburn and you damage some DNA on your skin, the BRCA2 mutation comes and fixes the DNA. If it's damaged, it can lead to cancer because it doesn't, the DNA doesn't get fixed when it's broken. And so this can lead to familial breast cancer, which is how I found out that I had it because a year and a half ago, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. And um, as soon as I got diagnosed with breast cancer, my doctor said, we need to get you genetically tested to see if you carry um, the uh, mutation that could lead to it. So I had to spit in the little vial and they sent the vial off to a genetics lab. And it came back with me being positive for the BRCA2 mutation. So right away, um, I found out that BRCA2 is, is autosomal dominant. So you only need one dominant allele to have a mutation that can cause breast cancer. So what that meant then is that my siblings all had a 50% chance of also having it. Okay, so this is my family here. Um, here's my dad and my mom. Um, and these are my siblings, Ronnie, Peg, Joe, here's me and my little sister. So right away, my siblings all got tested. They had a 50% chance of having it. Um, Mary didn't have it, Joe didn't have it, and Ronnie didn't have it. But my older sister, Peg, also had the exact same mutation as me. So that's why um, my sister and I are filled in here to indicate that we have the BRCA2 mutation. Um, my mom was tested because my dad is deceased. And so we, my mom got tested and she doesn't have it. So that means my dad passed it on to me and my sister. Okay, so my dad had to be um, homozygous dominant, I'm sorry, heterozygous. My mom was homozygous recessive, she doesn't have it. And she passed, uh, my dad passed on his, um, dominant allele. Now, uh, I, I actually went further back in my family and um, uh, figured out that it, mu it most likely was my grandma, Laura, who passed it on to her son, um, because my grandma, Laura, had a sister, Doris, my great aunt, who had kids that had the BRCA2 mutation, who had kids that have the BRCA2 mutation. So I, this, is, this is traveling through um, other parts of our family. So that's why I thought, it, um, that's why I figured it came from my grandma, Laura. Now, um, 
because my grandma Laura has it, um, had it, then my uncle Tom and my aunt, aunt Lori also had a 50% chance of getting it. Because if somebody has it, here's the Punnett square for BRCA2 mutation. So here's, this is my dad here and my mom. And so my sister and I fell on this 50% side of this Punnett square where my other siblings who don't have it fell on this side. But if, if you have a parent that has the genetic disorder that's autosomal dominant, all of their children have a 50% chance of getting it. Um, so I'm trying to get, I'm trying to convince my um, uncle Tom, who's my dad's brother right here. I'm trying to convince him to get tested. Um, he doesn't want to be tested. He doesn't want to find out if he has it because he's worried that if he does and his kids have it, that they're going to be mad at him. Like it was a choice. It's not a choice. It just happened, right? Um, Tom has 15 descendants. So he's got a lot of people that should be interested in knowing whether or not he has the BRCA2 mutation, because if he does, then his son, Chris, and daughter, Karen, and son, Steve, these are all my very close cousins, um, they could also be have um, carry it. They have a 50% chance if Tom has it. Um, and then if they have it, their kids have a 50% chance and so on. So the reason I made this intense pedigree of my family was not because I just wanted to, because it was fun, but it, it was fun. Um, it's because I'm trying to convince Tom to get tested for BRCA2. Um, consequently, my aunt Lori has already been tested and she doesn't have it. So none of her family members have to worry about it. All right, so um, going back to then your homework for tonight, what you have to do for tonight. Um, you're gonna do a couple of Punnett squares. So the first set is um, looking at another autosomal recessive disorder, which is a little more serious than albinism, um, cystic fibrosis. So again, um, I usually use S, um, Fs for cystic fibrosis because they're easy to tell the difference between the uppercase and the lowercase. Um, so you're gonna do a couple Punnett squares looking at how um, this, this autosomal recessive disorder gets passed on. And then you have two Punnett squares where you're looking at an autosomal dominant trait and I'm using BRCA2 um, so you can um, see the possibilities of passing this on to um, your children. And then you have to start looking at pedigrees. Okay, so really what we use a pedigree for is not just to like say who's older and who's who to who. It's really they're used to track genetic disorders. Okay, so the first thing you're gonna have to do is, is figure out what condition each one is showing. And I wanna point out for this first one, pedigree two, and I hope everyone's paying attention right now. Um, this is the key to whether or not this is autosomal dominant or recessive. You have two normal parents. So um, if somebody is filled in, that means they have the disorder. You have two normal parents that have a kid with the disorder. So is that gonna be autosomal dominant or autosomal recessive? It has to be autosomal recessive, right? Because you can't have a dominant trait where a kid has it that doesn't have a parent with it. So then you're gonna use the letter A and you're gonna, going to write in everybody's um, genotypes that you can. If you don't know their genotype for sure, you're gonna write an A with the line or some people do an A with a question mark. Like they know they're dominant, but they don't know what their second letter is for sure. Um, this second pedigree looks a lot more like the one I just showed you of my family. So every generation has it. Every kid that has it has a parent that has it. So you have no kids showing up with the disorder that doesn't have a parent that has it. Okay, so this is an example of autosomal dominant. And so knowing what we just did, what we just said, label all of the genotypes of everybody using A's. 
All right, I'm going to be done talking. So the rest of the time, um, the rest of the hour,